Major funding for these broadcasts has been provided by grants from New York Community Bank, Capital One Bank, Eastern Consolidated, M&T Bank, Sterling National Bank, Meridian Capital Group, the Wickoff Organization, Aerial Property Advisors, Chase Commercial Term Lending, Chase Mortgage Lending, Perfect Building Maintenance, Genova Burns. Additional funding has been provided by AKA Hotels, Corming Communities, AmTrust, Title Insurance Company, AVR Realty Company, Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, Bank Laumi USA, Briarwood Organization, CBRE, Citizens Bank, Cohen Equities, Colliers International NYC, Collins Building Services, Connect One Bank, CPEX Real Estate Services, Dime Community Bank, Douglaston Development, Levine Builders, Flushing Bank, Friedman LLP, Handrow Properties Handler Real Estate Organization, Hodges Ward Elliott Inc., iFunding, Investors Bank, James D. Kuhn Real Estate Center at Syracuse University, Kilroy Architectural Windows, Madison Realty Capital, Matone Group, Mercantile Commerce Bank, New Banks, Newmark Grub Knight Frank, People's United Bank, Polsonelli, Rosewood Realty Services, SJP Properties, Stonehenge Partners, TD Bank, Terra, CRG, The Knackle Group at Cushman and Wakefield, The Moynian Group, and These Friends. Oh, Crystal Apple. What, what's the year look like? You know, where do we see in the different asset classes? Where, where is it going to be? Is retail there? Is it development? Is it multifamily? Tell me, Crystal Apple, what's going to happen? But unfortunately, the Crystal Apple doesn't answer the questions. So I've assembled this group of dynamic, emerging young leaders. I think you're the oldest at 34. Um, who are going to provide their insight on where they see the outlook for 2017. My guests today include Joey Kosum, who's Director of Multifamily Housing in New York City for Marcus and Millichap. Um, Evan Petraka, who's the Assistant Project Manager at Triangle Equities. Uh, Louis Jerome, who's a partner at JEMB Realty. Uh, Johnny Cohn, who is Director of Acquisitions, Dispositions, and Financing for Conan Equities. And last but not least, Stanley Chira, who is a partner at Crown Acquisitions. For young people in the business, you know, some of you came into the business after 2008 when the world changed. Then we had a 2014, which was a great year, 2015. And people were complaining that 2016 was a tough year. But it wasn't a tough year when you compare everything. How, how do you see the luxury retail, especially now with uh, the change in uh, Br Brexit, okay, the new president, all this? I think it's very interesting. We, we saw that there were 60 million tourists visited New York City in uh, last year, and that's up from about 56 million the previous year. And we've seen a steady increase. You know, people forget you know, how much tourism really increased over the years for New York City. There was a time where just a couple of years ago we were at 40 million. Um, and I think that it's interesting to key into two main factors in that. One being that 80% of the tourists that are visited to, to New York are actually domestic tourists. And I think what we're seeing is, is a flight to what I call safety. I think that there is a, a growing concern with security and terrorism around the world. So people are choosing to stay more domestic because they feel safer. And I think that that was, played a major role in our election as well. You saw that that was a major concern of a lot of voters. Um, so when you have that, that's obviously a strong consumer base for New York City. The other thing that's, I think, very important to recognize is that the number of Chinese tourists grew 10% last year. So from about 800,000 to close to 900,000. 
And what people don't understand is the power of the Chinese tourists. They represent almost five or six regular tourists in their consumer power. Um, it's pretty amazing what's going on with them. And with President Obama extending visas from one year to 10 year visas in 2014, it really changed um, how the Chinese travel. And I think that's going to play a major role in you know, how retail is affected. You know, you bring up a couple of good points. One is the fact, which I'm aware of, that a lot of the visitors are really domestic visitors from the U.S. because this is where they want to go. This is where you're coming for conventions. You know, unfortunately, they're not going to Atlantic City as much as they did before, okay? So I think that's an important point. But I think the other matter that the people who are visiting to New York are spending money in New York and they want the amenities over there, which now relates to a subject of what you're doing. Your family is involved with a property called Lighthouse Point. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about that. And that's a question, you know, of people saying, do I want to go to Staten Island? But it's a great view. It's, a, you know, let's. I, I think Staten Island, what it has going for it is, um, especially down on the waterfront, is, is commanding a very unique uh, vantage point of the New York City skyline and bringing uh, a tourist destination that's unlike any other in, uh, in the city, really. Um, with uh, an observation wheel, an outlet center, um, and some pretty incredible, you know, historic waterfronts where you're able to see the city from a different vantage point while taking a free ferry ride and, and seeing the uh, Statue of Liberty all at the same time. Um, there's a lot of tourists that we see just down on the site when we're, we're actually in construction right Which now. Which relates specifically, you know, to Stanley's comment that visitors are coming. Now, I will unequivocally say that many of these tourists may have not thought of Staten Island in the past because, you know, a 540-foot wheel, an outlet center might bring certain tourists, and the fact that, you know, it's a free ride uh, over there. But I, I think, you know, that's, that's a change. In the residential world, how do you see Staten Island? How do you see the residential market in general? Well, in the residential market in general, I would say it's pretty positive. I think 2016 was a little bit of a transition year. Uh, prices started falling off a little bit, but I think now, now they're steady. I think the biggest thing we have to look for in 2017 uh, is what I call the three R's, is rents, uh, regulations, and rates. And what's going to happen to rates is going to directly affect pricing. And um, we're already starting to see a little bit of decline in the residential rents um, as of right now. As far as Staten Island, uh, most of my clients usually focus on the four boroughs, um, so I don't uh, specifically cover Staten Island, uh, but I know uh, Evan's been pretty active there. So re relating to the, the residential market, you're involved with the residential market both in Manhattan and other places, how do you, and, you're, and you're building something right now in Brooklyn yes. on the residential. So how do you, uh, is JEMB bullish on the residential market? Well, actually, the, the development site that we had in Brooklyn originally, you know, we were, we were bullish. And um, we saw the uh, amount of uh, inventory coming through the pipeline, the amount of apartments that were just, you know, flooding the marketplace. And uh, with our Brooklyn development, we had switched to office. We think there's an incredible opportunity there. Uh, we love our site. Uh, we just partnered with, uh, with Forest City. So we have great partners there as well. Um, as far as residential, uh, we do have a 690-unit a uh, building on the corner of 34th and Broadway called Herald Towers. And uh, to your point, actually, um, you know, a lot of our neighbors even uh, have seen uh, growth either slow down or pretty much stop. Uh, past few years, it's been 5% or 6% or, or so. And, um, you know, gradually we've seen that come down to maybe 3%, 2%. Uh, in fact, right now they're, uh, they're almost flat, uh, almost no growth. Uh, and a very telling sign, actually, is... Uh, the concessions that we're giving to a lot of our our tenants, a lot of our residents. Um, we used to give uh, one month free or paying the broker. Uh, now we're giving two months free if they come in without a broker or one month free and paying the broker. Uh, the idea is to get as many people towards our building as possible. Um, but I do think we are seeing uh, a bit of a, a slowdown, uh, if you will, in the rental market. Um, and I have to think that has to do with the, just the abundance of, of inventory uh, and just the, the options out there for a renter. It's a great time to be a renter, really. Johnny, what do you see? I mean, you, you, the company has been around many years with, seeing, with Mayor, then CK, and now the Cone Equities. 
and you really you're all over the country. Yep. So what what are you looking for? I, I mean, you know, yeah. so, and, and it's really the same question that I'm going to ask every else. What, what are you looking for in the future? So where do you see 2017, and where do you see the type of acquisitions? So we're very opportunity driven. Uh, so as you said, uh, our company's been around for over 30 years. We've been focused mostly in New York. In the last five years, uh, we started making investments all across the country. We're in over 25 states. Uh, mostly in retail and office, and we acquired uh, many assets from special servicers and banks. And over the last five years, what we've really done is become much more institutional. So we've had, you know, uh, kind of hedge funds, investment funds, uh, kind of come in and partner with us, and that's really helped us grow. And and what we've seen is, since Trump's been elected. The 10 years gone from 1.7 to 2.3 uh, and probably continue to go up. The federal funds rate will go up, I assume, in December, probably to 0.5 percent. I think that's what markets are, are implying. Uh, and at the same time, people are betting on infrastructure investment and investment spending. So we're very bullish on, uh, on D.C. office specifically. We have a million square feet of, of office in D.C. Um, we're also bullish on, on other major markets that are well-located, well-transited. And uh, we think that, I mean, you have guys like John Gray saying that the whole game, the whole real estate game is, has changed over the last month since, since Trump's been elected. And I think, um, I think this looks a lot like a second term, uh, a second Bush term, in the sense that rates are slowly rising, but people are assuming growth will be higher, uh, inflation will be higher, but rents will also get kind of keep up. So we're bullish and, and uh, we're very opportunistic and we're very return focused, uh, kind, of, kind of achieving 20 plus re return for our investors. So that's I, I have four families basically here. I have basically three, third generation, correct? Yes. Third generation. Fourth. Fourth, fourth actually. Oh, fourth, right, but yeah. grandpa was in, in, in the retail business. Yes. So, so fourth. And basically, the the third, third, third second, grandpa third. was construction. Right, grandpa was construction. So, with family businesses, how do families look at the the opportunities? Because sometimes, when people perceive that the market is not a good opportunity, it's probably the best opportunity. And and your dad, who's always gone through you know unusual opportunities up in the Bronx and Queens and other markets, has always been able to figure out you know, avenues of unique financing. So what do you see the opportunities for Triangle and Google? I think, uh, as you mentioned, a lot of you know, family uh, businesses have a little bit of a different time horizon and looking at investments, so a lot more patient capital that they're bringing. So we look at investments a little bit different where maybe we're looking at something that's, uh, you know, 10 years from turning instead of, uh, you know, looking to get in and uh, build something where ground up mostly uh, or you know value add we're we're gonna bring some type of construction into our projects um, so we have a little bit of a longer term time horizon we're not looking to turn around in five years and and, and flip out of something so we, we because of that that patience that we have that that we're we're willing to go into some <coughs> other which asset areas. class do you think you are looking at as your favorite asset class in the future okay because you've I mean, what you did at the hub was a retail asset class. What, what you're doing at Lighthouse Point is a mixed-use asset class. But I would say, in general, a lot of the work that Triangle has done has been geared to retail. Yes, that's true. And that's where we're, we'll continue to focus on, on really looking at mostly grocery-anchored retail. That's what we like to have a strong grocer-anchored because I don't think that e-commerce, we've mentioned that earlier, is going to take you know, groceries away from a lot of communities, and that's going to be a strong anchor. <coughs> Yes and no. I mean, e-commerce and groceries, you know, if you if you look at the Peapod, if you look at the, all, all of the other services, the Amazon Fresh, it has an effect. But what uh, uh, what Stanley said before the show, I think, bring out with the e-commerce and bricks and mortar. Yeah, so I, I think that there there's some growing concern with what kind of impact that e-commerce will have on brick and mortar retail. But I actually think it's a positive. I think that it's a great incubator for small retail companies to grow without a huge overhead. And what you're seeing now is the likes of Bonobos 
and Warby Parker, even Snapchat doing a temporary store with the Snapchat sunglasses, and you're seeing that they're now coming into brick and mortar retail. I think the Nirvana concept that retailers now have is the omni-channel experience. And I think that the synergy between brick and mortar and flagship retail and e-commerce really lends itself well. Um, I think if you look at all of the reports of struggling retail, the major theme is a contraction, um, but a flight to quality. So, you know, more flagships, more important stores, um, but a contraction of mall stores and outlet stores. You know, relating to that, I think, you know, let, let's follow up uh, with Lewis over here. I mean, you have one of the largest H&M stores in the nation over there in Herald. Yeah, it's the okay. largest H&M actually in the world. Um, and to Stanley's point, if there is a transition to retail, uh, I, think, uh, I think prime locations like Herald Square, um, I think almost are, uh, are protected from a lot of the, uh, a lot of the forces that are impacting uh, some of the other retailers. Um, at a certain point uh, in Herald Towers, for example, we have Gap on the, on the corner there. Uh, at a certain point, they were the largest grossing Gap in, in the country. Uh, the same for Forever 21, I believe, and across the street prior to H&M, several of those tenants as well. So I think um, while some you know, secondary locations might take a, a bit of a dip, which I'm sure is something that Stanley had spoken about, I think those prime corners, uh, I think those are going to be uh, you know, just... Uh, very unique, very spectacular, and um, you know it's, it, it is New York at the end of the day in these markets. Joey, two questions. One relates to your involvement when you see family businesses and where they're looking to buy asset class mm -hmm. and uh, their interest with regard to multifamily. And the second question relates to Stanley's comment before about the Chinese investors. So uh, as far as uh, families and where I'm seeing them um, kind of migrate towards is just triple-A locations. Uh, for example, we're selling uh, several buildings in the West Village right now, and every family that hasn't bought in the last 20 years is starting to pop their heads out. And something that Lewis mentioned earlier, now that rates are starting to uh, creep up, it's uh, heavy leverage type deals, um, low, low leverage deals, so a lot of cash required. Um, so they're still very bullish in multifamily in, in strong locations like Chelsea, West Village. Um, and it's been very aggressive. Those deals happen to be trading at 85% stabilized, um, you know, apartment buildings at almost a 1% return. Um, and as you know, you're not going to get much leverage there. Um, and we're st still seeing a lot of foreign investment, including a uh, Chinese buyer. Uh, we sold a couple of properties uh, recently to a, ch a Chinese family uh, and also a Japanese family who have still been very bullish uh, in bringing their money to New York. Uh, and uh, they're buying more of the free market product. Not, they can't um, deal with the regulations of New York City, mm -hmm. and they're honing in on the free market status apartments, um, which has become uh, pretty attractive to those type of foreign individuals. Well, in reality, many people are looking for rent regulated, some Correct. of the investors. Yeah, so it's kind of flipped a little bit. Um, we just recently did a survey, and uh, it's almost 50-50 of the buyers want... Uh, uh, free market uh, or uh, rent stabilized, where uh, before it was give me all rent stabilized, but because of all the restrictions and the regulations, uh, you know, uh, over 2015, the Rent Regulation Act of 2015, uh, it's been a lot more challenging to get through some of the red tape. Where do you see, okay, you know, we're, a lot of people, there are different asset classes. We brought up multifamily. We've spoken about retail on both sides of the coin. Uh, we haven't spoken about industrial. How do you see the industrial market? And then we're going to go to the unique, to the gaming, to the other areas. Um, you know, we, we really focus on retail specifically. And, you know, we're, it's, it's our core business. It's what we know. It's in our blood. My family operated retail stores for many generations. Um, so we're really focused on that sector. What about the luxury? I mean, you own 450 Park Avenue with somebody. I mean, that's not a retail. I mean, you have some retail downstairs. But. Usually when the office comes attached to the retail, we'll take the office. <laughs> I think also hotels are something that, uh, you know, we're seeing some movement on a little bit as well. Um, the hotel market was booming. Um, 
just a few years ago. I think it's starting to slow down a little bit. No, don't say that to him. They Sorry. have a hotel Over going supply. Up. They're opening up a hotel. But you see, I think, it's, I think you're 100% correct on the hotel, that there's been an oversupply. The question is how many hotels can be built for different markets. In Staten Island, there are basically three or four hotels, so the Staten Island can probably take one or two new hotels. While, you know, the question is how many more hotels can you have in Times Square? Ironically, the occupancy in Times Square for a hotel is close to 90%. Let's, now let's focus on something which I know your dad would probably get angry that I bring it up. But let's go to some of the outskirts to the suburbs. People are talking today there's a resurgence in certain parts of New Jersey and specifically Newark. Any thoughts about Newark? Newark, uh, we're... You know, I think long term Newark will play out well. It's so very close to the city, uh, a lot of development going on, uh, and I think long term I think Newark will be okay. We're more focused outside of New York. We're more fo more focused on. You just bought something in Philadelphia. We just bought um, a 400,000 square foot uh, office condominium in a in a major building. Uh, Former Re retail, Strawberry and Crowley. Correct. Uh, P Reits right below us. So outside of New York, as, as the acquisition we did in Philly, we're very focused on quality, well-transited, and some sort of value-add play. So, for example, in the Philly deal, the blocks are, are, it's very rare to get kind of the 50,000 square foot blocks for, for office space. And we know that there's a lot, we've spoken with various different brokers and seen the demand. So I think similar to what we did in D.C. where we came in, we bought a million square feet. Uh, one of them, uh, one building was completely vacant, 325,000 square feet. We had um, various different tenants interested and we just leased uh, the entire building to, to you, it's a public company. Um, and we put it on the market for sale. Um, so for us outside New York, I think we're focused on finding the value at play, uh, coming in with, with some sort of edge if we can uh, and executing on our, on our strategy. You're involved with something in East Orange. Let's talk about that. Yes, we're uh, looking at a uh, grocery anchored center in East Orange, very transit oriented. Um, uh, and I think we, we like uh, those types of projects that, that have that transit access that are outside uh, New York City, that have a strong anchor as a, as a grocer in place. Uh, especially in communities that, that utilize their grocery store, that aren't doing the Fresh Direct, that aren't going on uh, the internet to get their um, shopping. It draws a lot of foot traffic to a center and, and uh, makes it a, a good asset class for us to be in. I mean, you're all over. I mean, besides luxury, they're, you're mostly luxury retail. Luxury right? and bread and butter and retail. Bread and, bread and brother retail. <laughs> what about the... The suburbs to you. I mean, both of you live on the Jersey Shore in the summer. What do you think of the opportunities out there? Well, our investments in New Jersey, uh, we have a casino in, in Atlantic City, um, which uh, I really believe that Atlantic City's best days are really ahead of it. Um, we just got a huge uh, a victory, if you will. Uh, there was a referendum, I'm sure everybody knows, about uh, bringing north, uh, bring to North Jersey some casinos. And um, it was defeated soundly. Uh, I think it was like 78% uh, to 22% or so. And uh, we're seeing, at least in Atlantic City, is uh, there used to be 11 casinos or so. I think now we're down to seven uh, multiple casinos. It's like the hotel you, you brought up before. At a certain level, you can be profitable. When you have too many properties in the same situation, it's difficult. And I, and I do believe Atlantic City. I was really talking more about the, the Jersey Shore and other parts of, of the state of New Jersey. I mean, have you invested? We haven't. I mean, our grandfather always taught us to, you know, stay in markets that are all year round markets. At least the Jersey Shore is more of a summer town. Um, and it's hard enough to do business in 12 months, no less than two months. <laughs> yeah, agreed. So, so if, if, if I had to take Joey's crystal apple, because Joey and Peter gave it to me, and, I, and I'd and i say, where are the best opportunities for 2017? Where do you see the opportunities for your company? My heart always is uh, with residential. I love the type of asset class. Uh, it's nice dealing with uh, people who are looking, to, uh, you know, to looking for their home. Since I'm a Brooklyn boy, do you think Brooklyn's a great opportunity? Brooklyn's incredible. I love Brooklyn. Uh, the 2017 wall maturities for us will provide more opportunistic 
uh, and distressed opportunities. So for us, it's really in, in other in major cities throughout the country, including New York, uh, where we can jump in and execute our strategy. I think for us, it's focusing inward. You know, I was listening to a Vornado earnings call where Chairman and CEO Stephen Roth said, the best gets better before mediocre gets good. And it's a concept that we subscribe to. It's something that we believe in. That's we, why he's getting rid of his Washington, D.C. portfolio? Right. No, but if he, I think what you said is very valid. He got rid of his suburban shopping centers because they were not good. I mean, it was just a weak arm link hurting the company over there. I think for us, it's just we've seen over, you know, generations that the, you know, the best streets and the high streets that are supply constrained and that are tight have always grown in value uh, at s uh, such a rapid pace and so much greater than, you know, the secondary and tertiary streets. I'm looking forward to 2017. I think um, on the multifamily side, uh, there's still a ton of capital on the sidelines and uh, people are still bullish and there's a lot of opportunities to come um, even with all the uh, talk about interest rates and rents uh, and regulations. I think uh, there's still a ton of opportunity in the New York multifamily sector. I think we're going to continue to uh, look at transit-oriented uh, retail uh, anchored mixed-use projects that we can leverage some uh, different types of financing into the capital stack to uh, create value. Anything that's attached near the subway or near a highway or, you know, something that's, you know, the conversion. The, for a good example, Short Hills Mall, one of the most successful shopping centers in the country, Roseland uh, basically converted a Macaulay building uh, to residential. They knocked down the office portion and they're making it residential. The reason is it's convenient to mass transit. People want to have the opportunity to be near a shopping center, and those opportunities are over there. Um, what about investors? Do you see do you do you see more investors dealing with you, or do you do you co-invest with other people? We do. I think uh, over the last ten years, we've uh, institutionalized quite a bit. So whether it be the private equity guys or the pension funds, you know, the likes of Oxford, Morgan Stanley, Carlyle. And it's, it's been a great um, learning experience for us, understanding you know, their capital pockets. I, I did a show a couple of years ago, and the person owned the Chelsea market. And he said, I wanted it, but my hedge fund partner said to me, I can't own it any longer. I have to sell it. You know, there's a pro and con, especially even Triangle, because you never took institutional capital until this year. Right. The, the holding stream is a little different. It is, but we've actually found ways to create opportunity even in that pocket. So you've seen in many cases where we bought something like 170 Broadway. We, we bought it with Carlisle and Highgate. We redeveloped it, and then we actually recapped it with Morgan Stanley and now owning it long term. So there is some opportunity with strategic investors as well. What about your family? My family, uh, my grandfather runs the company, and so we're, we're really old school. We own 100% of pretty much every property that we own. Uh, 150 Broadway, 75 Broad, Herald Towers, Herald Center, uh, for the most part. Uh, my brothers and I are trying to really uh, adapt a little bit to this newer model. Uh, we'd love to bring in uh, new equity and, and find new deals like that. Um, but uh, for the most part, we do all of our deals 100% with our own equity. Yeah, we're, be Good. we're becoming, uh, we've become more and more institutional over the last five years, and done programmatic type investments, like I said, with hedge funds, and they've been very happy with, with our returns, and it's, it's, uh, we've kind of jumped into the pool with raising more and more kind of, uh, more and more capital and, and considered even raising a fund, so. And I think, uh, as Joey would tell you, I don't want to put words in, but the private equity people are a very active player. Still very active, especially in the uh, smaller middle market space where they're looking to put um, equity out to the operators that have a track record and, uh, and uh, are still very active. So, Crystal Apple, you look pretty good for the year, and hopefully we'll see you back, all of you back. But I'd like to thank Joey, uh, Evan, um, Lewis, Johnny, and Stanley, and I'll see you next week.